Boa tarde a todos. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, it is my pleasure to receive you here for another seminar at the Bolongo Observatory of the Federal University in Rio. And it's a great pleasure to be able to introduce today uh, Didier Kelo. Um, he is a, he's got a PhD in physics from the Geneva University. He's the Jacksonian professor of natural philosophy in Cambridge. And mm -hmm. since March of this year, he's also the, the new director of the new Center for Orange and Prevalence of Life at ETH, the, at the Institute in Zurich in Switzerland. Uh, most of you will probably know Professor Kelo from his work detecting the first exoplanet uh, orbiting a main sequence star, which he discovered with Michel Maillot in, in 1995. Uh, this is 51 Pegasi B. And for the discovery, of course, he has received the Nobel Prize in Physics in 2019, uh, in, together with James Peebles as well. And in addition, he's also received the Wolf Prize in Physics in 2017 and the Frontiers of Knowledge Prize from the BBVA Foundation in 2011. Many other prizes, of course. Uh, his research since then has focused mostly in our capacity to detect and investigate exoplanets, to study their physical properties, and he's actively participated in many instruments that have been uh, fundamental for the, for the for those kinds of studies, including Coho, uh, Harps, and Kiops as well. And, and Professor Kelo is also uh, very interested in science outreach and science communication in general. He's participated in many documentaries, films, and TV interviews, of course. And he's also sharing his knowledge and his enthusiasm for the field of astronomy and exoplanet in general. Uh, and we're very, very excited to have him here talking to us uh, about his, his research right now. So, Professor Kelo, thank you very much for being here. And I'll give you the floor right now. So, thank you. Thank you very much for this very kind introduction. So, I will share my presentations. That is um, about what I do call um, the exoplanet revolution. It's a revolution for for various reasons. It's a revolution first because we have a new perspective on the what are exactly. Okay, you should be able to see my slide right now. Is right? Is it, is it correct? Yes, this is perfect. We can we can see it. Thank you. Thank you. Um, it's also a revolution on the on the on the nature of uh, of um, of these many different systems. Um, and also that the fact that it opens the questions about whether there are some of this planet that uh, um, could have um, be the right place uh, for life to to develop. And um, what I will do with with uh, small small I mean I mean short presentation in a way, and it's just going to be true. Um, what I do believe are the punchline of what we are really learn and what we we can hope to do in the next couple of years um, um, on the on these questions about the origin of life i will give you a little bit of an idea um the way we're going to treat that okay let me just first with the beginning so um, i always like to start with this picture because that is and that will be for a long long time the only planet for which we can study them in great detail and that will be certainly the only planet for which we can study them in situ and bring back something so it means that um, the solar system as it is, is our own reference. Like the Earth is a reference for the origin of life, the solar system is the reference for, for the planetology. Um, and, and this is something which has profound consequences um, because a lot of this planet that we have detected orbiting other stars, they don't really qualify as being similar to uh, the one of the solar system. And, uh, and and that's that's a cer certainly something that has completely changed the perceptions about how exactly we fit into the grand landscape of the many planetary systems orbiting other stars. Well, the first element I would like to share with you, if you're not really familiar with the uh, planets, they are very different from stars from, from the very reason they build from inside out. They're not built by collapse of gas. They, they build on the seed that we call a core. And, uh, and this core, I mean, acting like um, 
magnet or an attraction and, and attracting uh, the, the matter uh, and building up, uh, growing the planet from inside out. That's why you have a structure with different composition. You also have the fact that there is a, a sink into this planet, so the heavy material tend to sink in, in the middle. And, and this structure of the planet is very profound because this is a, the reason why, um, and I mean, we, we, have a, we have a kind of a theory of the planet formations, which is very, very different um, from, from, from the way we, we understand the formation of, of stars itself. So let me just go through some of the elements here that are relevant for, for the purpose of understanding um, why it was such a surprise when we came up with the first discoveries and, and actually why it is still a big surprise to find all this, this uh, planetary system that we have right, right now. Well, the story starts with the disk, as you know. I mean, um, when, you, when you form a star, you have, you have some angular momentum and some leftover. It's very few, actually. It's talking about a few percent of the matter that you had when you formed the star. This is essentially gas. It's essentially um, hydrogen and a bit of helium. In, uh, on, on that picture here, this is not the gas you see. It's all the solids, all the, all the small solids that you have in the disk, which is a tiny fraction compared to the gas. So if you think about the gas left over from the star is few percent, well, you also have few percent of the gas that is actually the solids. Uh, but the solids, um, because of the radiation from the star, um, they have a temperature. They are, um, and, and there is an equilibrium on the temperature of the solids and they radiate. And what you see here is the radiations um, uh, of the solids that is picked up uh, in a very far infrared by ALMA. It's about 60 degrees um, above the, um, uh, the, the absolute zero here. So, so this is, this is uh, the beginning of the story. And, and this, this picture is, is, quite, is quite striking because we, we do understand by, by looking at that, there's a lot of structure in this disk. It's not, they're not really a simple disk. They are kind of grooves, they're kind of waves. Um, and, and certainly the reason why these disks are the way they are is that there is a lot of interaction going on inside the disk. And one of the main reasons why you could steer such a such effect is having a, some planet being formed right now into this disk. Now, the idea that planet is forming the disk is, is, is quite old. And, um, but actually, there is something behind which is, uh, which is interesting is, is how you can build up the planet from these, these structures. To understand that, you have to look at a different way disk. You have to look at the disk from the edge. And we have a beautiful example here, uh, which is Beta Peak, which is, um, which is um, uh, a disk seen really uh, uh, from, from the perspective or, or only seeing the, uh, the vertical uh, I mean, dimension of the disk. And I show you two pictures. They are the same same scale, and uh, it's about the scale of similar scale that they had before, a little bit larger. The picture on the top is an HST image in the visible. Um, you have, a, of course, you have a, a, a kind of a gap on obscuration mask on, in, in the middle to protect you from the light from the from the star. And again, what you do see here, it's not the thermal radiation; it's just the reflection you have from all these small particles that I was mentioning before in the in the other disk or the the other object. Um, this is this is famous because you may see that there is a kind of inner warp uh, in, in kind of a second disk, secondary disk uh, close to the star uh, that have an angle. It's, it's called warps, um, and um, and the reason why is because there is a planet here that has been detected. So there has been fabulous picture of planet being seen in the system, and this is the reason why I mean this creates this structure. But there is something that I would like you to notice here: it's how thin is the vertical uh, dimension of a disk. So when you look at this matter, actually the whole matter is, uh, is collapsed on the midplane. And the reason why it's collapsed on the midplane is because the only dimension when you can really move there is the dimension that is within the angular momentum conservation. All the rest, the vertical dimension, I think this, uh, the, the matter is, is falling and, 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 then, and then crossing the disk. And then once it reached the other side, it's it's, it's brought back by the gravitation of the, of the disk. And in a way, you have, you have the matter here that is oscillating from up and down um, uh, over a very, very thin region. Well, when you compare the very same picture at the very same size, but when you look at the gas, um, 
In this case, this is uh, the CO that you're detecting here. Similarly with ALMA, but using the CO band. Well, what you do see here, it's a complete different picture you have. So we're talking about the same disk. The only difference is the disk on the top is, 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 the, is the, all the solid particle you have, anything which is solid. The picture on the bottom is the gas. Well, it's much more elongated vertically, and that makes a lot of sense. I mean, the, because because that's uh, just the the um, um, due to the pressure you have uh, you have into uh, into the disc. So the, the vertical pressure maintain a, a quite substantial uh, I mean structure vertically. That's what we call the hydrostatic equilibrium. And there is another uh, also interesting feature here. Um, if you look uh, at the edge, well, you do see that there is no disc anymore. And that's not because the sensitivity is not good enough. I mean, the, this image are really very sensitive because there is really practically no more gas. So what happened there, it's very simple. Uh, because it becomes cooler and cooler when you reach the edge of the disk, well, the gas, there is a point, reach the limit, well, it's not gas anymore. You have a phase transition and the gas becomes solid. So in a way, it's, it's snowing or it's becoming icy at that point. So this is a very critical um, and transition because, because you transition from a gas to a solid, then you don't have any more the pressure that is sustaining the structure of the disk. You don't have th this, uh, this balancing that you have on the other side. It means everything around that is at this location about in the, oops, sorry, in the edge of the, of the disk is going to fall on the mid plan. And it would be very similar to the picture you have here. So you have the situation when you have a lot of people, you can imagine, that are spread, uh, I think, uh, on, on a big area. And as a sudden, they all come together at the center. And what you do at, at, with this event, which is very specific, well, you create a lot of matter, which is gluing to each other, which is making the core of the planet. And, and the structure of the core that I show you at the beginning with the Jupiter, is the one that we understand, and that's the one that matched this scenario, which is which is a clear scenario, well understood. This is the reason why everybody was expecting to see essentially the big planet um, farther out, so not that close to the star. So this is the theory, this is the way we understand the practicality, and it's also something we do believe it's valid, because we have a lot of element on the disk that demonstrate that this is what happened. Now, the only thing that I don't show you here is once you form the planet, it does not mean the planet will stay exactly where it is. And, and that was the missing element into the formation, planetary formations. Actually, when you form a, a big planet, a giant planet this way, and you collapse all this gas and, and you have all these solids, well, the planet can move after. There is interaction with the disk, there is interaction between the planet. And that's the reason why you have plenty of planets, which is much closer. I mean, the big planets that needs this, this uh, to build a lot of matter um, and, and this is why you have so many planets that are not at these locations. But in the case of the solar system, this is where we're finding essentially all the planets that have captured the gas. That includes, of course, the giant planet, Jupiter and Saturn, but it includes also Uranus and Neptune, because they didn't, they were not that successful, but they were successful enough to capture quite a lot of gas. The telluric planet, the small planet, are different because they only build off uh, of the solid element. And most of these elements are more than solid. They are some of them. They've never been gaseous at all. They always stay in a kind of um, uh, in a in a material-like st uh, structure, uh, but they are very marginal compared to the rest of the other planet. And 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 the big planet or planet given some size will be expected at that distance. So what I'm going to do right now is I want to project 25 years of discoveries of planet to show you that I think nature have been very nice with us because they are created a lot of planets that we could not believe they existed and and that is this famous diagram when you just co combine two parameters or three parameters which is the period of the planet and either the radius of the planet or the mass these are all real data there is no theory here this is actual size of the planet has been found there's about four four thousand planets i think on this diagram here and um, and the radius come from the transit, so when the planet goes in front of it of the star, and to get the mass, you need to detect the the Doppler effect on on the spectra to to measure the the, the change the change of radial velocity of the star. 
small caveats, there is a little bit of uncertainty on the projection angle, but if you have a transit, you know where it is. So the blue is the one detected by transit, the red is the one detected by Doppler um, techniques here. So what is interesting with this diagram, uh, there is a couple of elements to, to notice. First, I mean, just to help you, to help your eyes, I mean, there is Jupiter, Earth, and Venus. Um, the unit or days and radius in Earth size and mass in Earth size, so Jupiter is 300 times the mass of the Earth, if you forgot about this. But it's something striking is there is a kind of a groups of planets. They, they, they are clearly identified as, as group. They're not feeling everywhere in the diagram. And there is no planet detected similar to the Earth and to Venus. Now, to understand that, what we have to do is we have to add the sensitivity of these techniques. So it's a kind of complicated method because there is, depending on what you do that, you have essentially a kind of a limit. And that's the, 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 the best possible achievement you can reach with the best possible instrument, which is not actually all the instrument available, but this is what is possible. Anything on the left side on this actual line can be detected. Anything on the right side is very, very difficult and very unlikely. And essentially, we can consider it's impossible at that point. Of course, new new discovery, new new detector would help. Now, let me just go through um, a little bit this limit because I think this is interesting. For for the transit, where you get the radius, um, the the first limit is just kind of a diagonal uh, limit here that essentially said uh, is saying if you want to detect a small transit, you have to repeat the test, the detections, and the more detection you have, the better signal to noise, signal -to -noise ratio you have, and it's the reason why you have this kind of limit here that goes there. And then there is a sh sharp transition, which is a bit artificial in my case because there's some detection here, but they are really rare. It's just telling you that the likelihood, the probability that you have a transit is just drastically falling apart when you have the planet too far away because it's just very rare. It becomes rare and rare and you have to get so many planets to find at least one which will be in a transiting configuration. So I would consider that transit is failing to detect any serious planet within some, some kind of distance and it's about, let's say, three, 400, 400 days of, of, of period. It becomes really difficult. The radial velocity is technically limited to how long you measure your, your stars. So it's the age of the astronomers, which is now 20, 25 years. And then, and then we, we, we have the similar idea of the sensitivity with the other caveat here that you're battling with the intrinsic variability of the stellar atmosphere. That makes your, your life very, very hard to improve. Even if you have the machinery to detect this, it becomes quite difficult here um, to make, make progress. There are also some other techniques I'm not mentioning there because they're marginal compared to this one. And I think we, we, we've we learned essentially everything about the planet as of today with these two techniques. This would change in the future. I think uh, Gaia is coming. Uh, we have a, um, a lot of opportunity of, by microlensing with space missions. Um, there will be there definitively in the future progress and direct imaging. But but at that point, I think right now the the, uh, the core purpose of the of the understanding we have on the on, on the planet comes from these two techniques. Now, I said we have different groups, and what is interesting here is to identify these groups and to try to have an idea. I mean, what is the uh, uh, the occurrence of each of these groups? So the first one we we will know very well is the one where that that where we had the first planet on 51 peg, which is this hot Jupiter group that is detected in transit, detected in radio velocity. We do have Jupiter detected in, in radio velocity. We have Jupiter much more massive than Jupiter, up to 10 times, 20 times, with then the open point, where do you stop? Where is the limit of a star or a failed star, a brown dwarf, and a planet? It's not very clear right now, but Gaia is certainly going to help, help us. There is some statistical argument that we can use for that. And then the big surprise is this kind of population here of planet that usually we call them uh, the compact super Earth and the compact Neptune's planet because they are within Earth and Neptune's. They compact because they're very close. It's a few days of period, one week, two weeks, three weeks. And that's a very, very big population here that has, has been detected. So when you want to um, find out the statistics of this, you have to assess the sensitivity of each of the surveys. Quite complicated, but right now people would agree with this number. Typically, if you have a star, this is your occurrence of finding a planet of that kind. So 1% to 5% of, of a Jupiter, 10, 10 to 20% of something that looks like within this region of a Jupiter, and more than half and up to 80% of planets that are of that kind. 
And that is what I call the gift of nature. Because without all these planets there, that have no counterpart in the solar system, I would not be talking to you very likely because I will be out of business. I think what have made the planet and the exoplanetology so successful, because we have find so many things we were not expecting. And that's the fascination of the story because we had this amazing picture of the formation of the solar system. We have sent many probes studying all this planet of the solar system in great detail. We know quite a lot of them, but actually we have a very, narrow-minded vision of the diversity of the planet you have in the universe. It's quite surprising, it's quite frustrating, but it's how astronomy goes. I think uh, we all know that uh, anyway, 90% of, uh, of the matter and the energy of the universe, we have no idea what it is. So we can certainly accept the fact that uh, by, by, by having a solar system of our own, we are, in a way, one amongst many, and we're certainly not among the vast majority of the system. So that's interesting bits. And uh, to tell you exactly how rare or, or what exactly is the likelihood of a solar system like our own, I don't really know, because right now we have not found any counterpart to really compare the statistics. But there's a lot of work on, on that, I'm trying to push a little bit the boundary, both on the transit with the new category of space mission, Plato, for example, and also on the radial velocity. And they will both make progress and, and bring, bring, um, bring the future here. Now, the interesting bits about this, uh, this, these populations is because it's a short period, that's the second gift. But it turns out that one technique that no one would have bet on it, which is the transit, I think turned out to be amazingly successful uh, because the likelihood of a transit is very high when you get a short period. So we have a substantial amount of small planet um, for which we can have the transit and we can measure the mass of this of this system. And, and that is this diagram when you combine the two and you enter into something that we do call, I think, uh, planetology, because it gives you an idea of the, what are made these planets. So we do see the, the Jupiter, the hot Jupiter. They're slightly bigger than Jupiter. This is where you expect Jupiter to be. So if you use the state equation of Jupiter, you would be landing along this line here. So they're essentially above this line, which means the density is less, they inflated. It's very likely due to the fact that there is a, a high energy coming beaming on the planet and there must be something happening on the planet because of this amount of energy. We don't really know exactly how to do that to make them inflated, but that's a fact. Now, when you move down to Saturn, we have a couple of Saturn like we can move down. We have mini Saturn clearly there, and we reach a point when you watch the Neptune mass here. Well, you cannot explain Neptune with the model of Jupiter. The reason for that is because there is far less light gas into Neptune that you have in Jupiter and Saturn. There is light, there is almost little, I mean, uh, helium and hydrogen in, uh, in, um, in, in, in Neptune, and that's much denser. So you need to change the state equations. To help you read that, I mean, this is not the state equation of, of Neptune. This is a state equation which is impossible, which is a water planet. So if you imagine a planet made only of water, the water inside with the pressure will not be the water you have in mind. It's different. It's ice. It's hot ice water. But but you would you would lie along this diagram. So you have this blue, um, I mean, actual line here. And, and it's interesting because we do have a significant amount of population here, a planet that seems to be a bit like Neptune, some clearly um, uh, with smaller, and you can go down, down, down until you reach even a planet of the mass two or three times the mass of the Earth. So it's quite surprising to imagine that you could have a, a Neptune kind of a planet, which is just three times bigger than, uh, three times more massive than the Earth. It's not something that we were really expecting. And what makes our, our life a bit more complicated is when you go down in size, you have also uh, a, another kind of a group of, of planet that is matching um, what we would call the Earth density. The Earth is one one, it's here, and you can extrapolate the Earth density. We do have clearly what we would call rocky planet here, the planet that would qualify like made of rocks, like, like is the Earth, without atmosphere. So at, at the level we're talking about, Earth has no atmosphere. Technically speaking, the, the, the atmosphere is so thin that is almost invisible. It, it goes into aero bars uh, for us. And there is a kind of interesting transition you kind of suspect here, which is known as the Fulton Gap, where you move from one to another. And, and there is a possibility that what you do see here is maybe due to the evolution of the planet because you're so close to the star. Remember, they're all short periods. So you may be just losing the atmosphere and starting as a Neptune and moving down here as a rocky planet. All this is this um, and planetology. And that's a completely a change of, of paradigm into understanding what 
we have in mind in terms of planet. So if we try to make a summary of this, well, what we start uh, realizing is, is the whole diversity of planet is, is way more complex than we thought. And this is a kind of a, an extended new diagram of what looks a planet these days. So we have, of course, giant planet, we have the Neptune, we have a good idea, we have Earth, that's okay, but we have clearly planet in between. So how you want to make them, how you want to call them, it's a bit to you, but they're clearly something between the Neptunes and Jupiter. And uh, is, is it massive core? Is it because they have a big core? Is it because they manage to attract a different uh, mixing of gas? We don't really know that. And then when you go down uh, the mass from Neptunes, then you can have a bit of everything. You can have a, what's called mini Neptune. So you take, make, make, you, you, you take Neptune and you shrink, you make it smaller. You can imagine you have a kind of a giant planet that attracts a lot of gas, a lot of, of hydrogen and, and helium. So you would get a gas dwarf. You can imagine you have Neptune, but you remove the outer atmosphere, the big outer atmosphere, and you end up with an ocean planet. Or you can imagine you make the Earth much bigger and uh, something rocky, a lot of rocks, and then you have a tiny, tiny atmosphere. So we don't really know that. That's the big challenge of no, the diversity of all the planets. So we went back from a very simplistic idea that if you get a mass, you know what we're talking about, and we have a good idea of, of the different population of planets to a uh, situation which is way more complex than um, having a mass on the size is clearly not enough. It gives you some hint what you're talking about, but if you really want to understand what you're talking about, well, you have to move to the atmosphere of this planet. Again, we're lucky because most of these planets are transiting, actually, and because they're transiting, there is two very specific moments you can learn something for the planet. is when the planet goes in front, it's called a transit. When the planet goes behind, it's called an eclipse. So how does it work? When you point a telescope into a star and you have a transiting planet, what you do see is the image on the top. So you see a change of flux and you have the time when you have the transit. So the planet goes in front of the star, but you have this time when your planet goes just behind, which is a fascinating moment. If you look down at the zoom on the bottom, it is the only moment here when you see only the star. It's quite funny to imagine. So you have a telescope observing a star, there is a planet, but the planet is a, is a, add some element that is, is not welcome in a way if you want to study the stars. But there is one moment when you can make for sure you, you measure the star is this moment. So if you think about that, actually the flux up to that level is the flux that come from the star and anything above comes from the planet. So when you observe a, a system, a star with a telescope, you observe at the same time the star and the planet. And if you're clever enough to know exactly what is the flux of the star, you can find out what is the flux of the planet. And that gives you what's called the phase functions or the, the day, day side, the night side, and you can study that in different wavelengths. You can get the, the thermal emissions, you can get um, the cloud deck uh, re reflection, you can get a lot, a lot of very interesting uh, physical element here by using these techniques. What you could do as well is you could use the transit, but instead of measuring a transit just as a single transit in a, in a multi-wavelength elements, you try to be more specific on the wavelength you observe your transit. So to understand that very simply, if you're not familiar with that, and I, I love this diagram, this is this picture. This is a picture from the ISS of uh, a very moment in the visible when, when we have the moon that is going, maybe I don't know if it's a, if it's a set, if the moon is setting or it's rising, I have no idea. But, but, but at least the moon is going to be behind here, the, um, the, the Earth. So we will treat the Earth as a planet and the moon as a, as a star, to make it simple here. So what I would like you to notice is the atmosphere here. This is a visible atmosphere. This is Rayleigh scattering. It's 20 kilometers about. Um, this is the atmosphere when you can fly with the, with the, with the plane easily. Um, and if you observe the very same picture the very, at the very same moment with another wavelength, like, for example, the infrared. So you see the, 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 the size of the planet have changed. Well, because here we don't see the atmosphere. We just see the thermal emission from the ground, which is the planet. Now, you can also switch to, to a wavelength which is very sensitive to a feature you have in a very high atmosphere, which is the ozone. In that case, you would see a much bigger planet. So I think you got from that, that depending on the wavelength you're observing, you're seeing a different kind of atmosphere of the planet. And well, the trick is actually from the size, because the transit, you only measure the size or the differential size of the transit, you can rebuild um, what's called retrieval, the structure 
of, of the planet. There is not a single solution, but they give you a pretty good idea um, what is the composition of the planet. Okay, now I hope I gave you enough hint to tell you that we do have planet, we do have small planet, we can measure atmosphere from this planet. Now, how much can we learn from this atmosphere of this planet? Well, actually we can learn a lot. And what I would like to focus on right now is the specificity about life, because everybody is talking about life. We have very small planet like Trappist, for example, uh, because of the size of the planet, there is a possibility we can measure something in the atmosphere. It has to be a still a big atmosphere, but um, 20 kilometers won't be enough. But if you have 200 or 500 kilometers, it may work. So if we're going to measure something from this planet, what can we say about what's going on on the planet? So you know the planet is rocky, you know the planet has an atmosphere. So what could you learn from this planet? And we, we have soon the launch of James Webb Space Telescope, so a lot of excitement on that. And maybe in 20 to 50 years, we'll be doing direct imaging uh, uh, where we will see directly the, the emission from, from this planet. And then we would be able to study them in great more detail. So the diagram I, I love to, to show is this one for Vicky Meadows. Vicky Meadows um, explained, I remember a couple of years ago, that we have to be very careful because um, um, she kept hearing that um, when we have uh, water and uh, ozone detected, it means we've detected life. And I know there's still a couple of my colleagues in astronomy that are a bit obsessed by this. And uh, I think we should be a little bit careful about the way we start to deal with that or understand that. And I want to show this picture, which is wonderful, I think. Vicky tried to demonstrate in this picture, it's like depending of the, the kind of atmosphere you have, uh, sorry, the, the, the kind of geophysical nature of the planet, you reflect on the atmosphere and you can produce easily water and oxygen uh, from completely different reasons than from life. And um, it's just a couple of examples uh, where you can play with that. We have to remind ourselves it's just chemistry. So when you, when you take water, you can break it. And when you break the water, it makes oxygen. So just remember all this and you can play around. And even the CO, you can break the CO, you're making oxygen and you have to find some some hydrogen somewhere and you can break apart the water and you bring there's a lot lot of stuff you can do in chemistry of course it depends on the exact pressure it depends on the size of the atmosphere it depends on the thermal profile there's a lot of element here but the key message here is if you want to understand anything about the atmosphere and if you want to say something about life i think you have to be honest you have to understand the geophysics first and once you have understood the geophysics you can maybe think about saying something clever about the origin of life. And I would like to um, expand a little bit on that to give you a little bit the idea of this development that we're trying to set up right now. So this is a kind of a very compact version of the history of the Earth. The Earth is still, as I said, we, we use the reference we can. And since we have the only example of life and we have a good understanding of the history of, of, of the Earth, it's still a good reference. Whether it's applicable for the other planet, I don't know. But at least we have a, a starting point here. So just to remind you that the, the Earth has an amazing story. I mean, it starts uh, as an astrophysical entity, what's called the nebular phase. You have to build up the Earth. You can move it around, and it doesn't mean it has to stay where it is. You can you make the moon at that time. You have a lot of gas at that time, and that is uh, in the planet. The planet cools down, and you have impact. This impact is changing the surface of the planet, is, is changing the atmosphere of the planet. You move from hydrogen and helium atmosphere to CO2 atmosphere to, to car carbon rich and rich you can have what's called late veneer that's what the geophysicists uh, call and then you end up with a, with essentially an, an atmosphere of co2 um, and then you and you start to uh, gradually bring something from inside of the planet uh, from the volcanic activity and you bring so2 you bring water even if the water is gone and the water is somewhere uh, under and you have to push the water back and you can have water coming from also um, a late event um, like a late bombardment event. Um, at the end, you get a, a completely a very global entity here. It, it kind of a, it's it's a, it's it's like an, a, a global organism that that you are you you're talking about here. And uh, and depending then whether you start life or not at the stage of the prebiotic uh, stage, well, you change the atmosphere. Well, the atmosphere could be different, could evolve. And remember, I remember you the whole history of the atmosphere. I mean, here this is very, very uh, schematics I'm doing, but actually there is a there is a flow into that, and uh, and this flow is is kind of well understood at the at the at the higher levels, which is the evolution of the gas we have had on on the planet. So you see on the on the left side here the gas, the, a couple of them, 
um, the carbon dioxide, methanes, oxygen, and then ozone with time. So this is when you form the planet. This is where we are right now, right? So what I want to show you here is the history of this gas has been quite dramatic in the history of life. For example, when you when you rise the oxygen, you drop the carbon dioxide. It's it's a momental. This is a has a big impact on the planet because the planet cools down very rapidly, and we very certainly have reached a level that we call the ice ball level right now. How we survive that, I don't really know, but life, I mean, managed to survive. Maybe we had have had dramatic volcanic activities that help to just get rid of it and bring a little bit back of carbon dioxide that to go, to do some global warming here. And then at some point, then we had so much oxygen that, that, that comes with life coming, then we start building the ozone and we get out of the continent. And this is where we are. So I just want to show you that a planet is a very complicated entity, and depending when you look at the planet, I remember I'm in the age of a system you're looking at, you can see a very different kind of planet. And the story of the Earth doesn't mean it has to be always like that. It's just one story here. And I would bet there are as many stories there are of planet here. So from an astro astrophysical perspective, what is fascinating is to look at the corresponding spectra you're getting at different phases. The Archean Earth, the very early, is getting a this very specific series of spectra, it's completely changing when you get the rise of the oxygen, and it's again changing again when you have something we call the modern Earth. So I think we will do that. Sooner or later, we will do that. We will do that very gradually. We'll do that with transit first, and then later we'll do that with direct imaging. But that will give us on, I don't know how many planets, I mean, technically we have an infinite number of planets we can observe, but if we stick to the nearby uh, um, stars, we may have hundreds of planets that would qualify as rocky that we could study in the next 200 years, maybe. And we should be able to tell that story and to see how far. Maybe we're going to see that they never, never reach oxygen. They're all um, kind of uh, CO2 dominated or they are very different. So this is what it is when you look for life. I think it's not, you don't look for life. You look for the global system that includes the chemistry of the global structure of the planet. And life is a byproduct of the planet. So if you want, the ancestor of life is the planet itself, which is making it. That's why it's so difficult for us to leave the planet. That's why we're not very well adapted. So, of course, there's a lot of problems to solve. The rise of the complexity of the chemistry. How do you bring the small molecule to being um, building blocks? So there's a lot of work being done in the labs right now. Chemists are working on that. We're teaming up because they need to, to find ways, which is not something you do in a lab, that's something you do on the dirt, because the dirt is a planet. So you have to find some ways to make it work at the planet scale. And it cannot be a small detail on some hot spots here and there. It has to be global. I think life has to be a global event, it has to be a global chemistry, because the chemistry anywhere will happen, whatever you do. And remember, there is nothing more competitive than chemistry. If you've been doing chemistry, or you can do that with the cooking. If you try to do cooking and you make a mistake in your cooking, well, it can it can go very uh, dramatically wrong and it could be really disgusting at the end what you ended up with. So, so it's exactly the same in the case of life. You have to get it right and you have to get it massive because anywhere chemistry will happen. And there is a lot of branching and some branching is go for life. But other branching may go for shampoo and not life at all. And then it takes all the chemical to do shampoos. At the end, you have nothing for life. So there is a very complicated growth of a structure here. And that progress has been made along these directions on the growth of the structure. So the big hope right now is we have a kind of a timestamp of what may have looked like on Earth at the after one billion years. So we're looking at that stage here. Uh, the first billion years. And we do believe that this is where we start the prebiotic chemistry and something must happen at that time and something must happen at the planetary scale. We do that with Mars. That's why people is crazy about Mars. Uh, we are on Mars. We are, we are pick up the beautiful places, which is this Jezero or Crater. We're somewhere here. And we're going to move around. I say we because it's international collaboration here and all this data will become public. Um, and then there will be a slow motion coming up and, up, and we're going to bring, I mean, collect, sample, and bring it back on Earth. That's really the big, big momentum. I, I, there will be some institute analysis for sure, but I think the big stuff is going to come when you bring back the stuff, because you will be able to use all the equipment we have to study every molecule you have into the into on Mars. So I don't think we should be obsessed by life here. I think it, it's not about detecting life. It's not at all. It's about understanding the geophysics at that time. And if you have had life, there is a couple of predictions about the, the, the chemistry of life, 
there is some model right now. Uh, we should find these traces. And we should have some evidence that some chemistry has happened on Mars and, and very likely similarly on, 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 the, uh, on the Earth. Um, so the, the good reason why we believe that is we are absolutely sure that there is water on Mars. That's, that is no doubt about that. And we are absolutely sure in the past there were a lot of water. So this Jazero crater, if you want to have an idea how it looks like, it's something like that. So you have this image where... And that's one of them. And we have a river flow. And that's exactly what you have here. This is a river flow you have here. And, and this brings a very interesting I mean, chemistry. You have a differential chemistry here going down the river flow, different oxidation level, different temperature level. And that is where we really expect to see maybe the, the, the chemistry of life or some traces of the chemistry of life. This is where we believe we, we're going to find something. So maybe this picture will become emblematic in 50 years because we will, we will I mean, this will be remembered as the place where we have found the first clear evidence how the, the onset of life um, and started. Now, I would like to push a little bit then um, and to open uh, about these questions about what it means looking for life uh, with the telescope as an astronomer. I keep being asked, I mean, what do you recognize life? What are you looking at? And blah, blah, blah. And I keep telling, well, this is not how it works exactly. I think this is a little bit more complicated. The problem we buy us uh, from essentially the SETI work where well they it's it's kind of an on off element so whether you get it or you, you never get anything and you don't understand what you're talking about so here we're working on a, another dimension we, we, we're working on a, on a on slow build up of knowledge about the global structure that is leading to life so remember what I mentioned to you so depending on the geo geophysical age of the planet you expect different response from the planet all these elements from the planet are understood as being critical. Like, what is exactly the prebiotic chemistry? So, so there is some element you can detect some of the gas relevant for the prebiotic chemistry. How far could you count of lightning? Lightning is one element that brings you energy. Remember, to make chemistry work, you need to bring energy. You, you need to do what's called catalyst. You have to find a way to break the energy barrier to make it work. How far do we see, I mean, sign of uh, impacts, big impacts and many impacts and, and, and so on and so on, big volcanism activity. All this technically could be detected because when you have this event, I mean, that's, I mean, then you can try to identify specifically what is the traces of some of these big events and you can combine this together. So there is very clear specific predictions that you can make of some of the ingredients, some of this molecule, which is related to some of the element. And the hope is, it's like a, a, a big book, but you never read the book. You just see one letter after another one, and it's exactly what we're trying to do. So we're going to do that. And of course, you need to observe the planet. You have to observe the atmosphere. We need to look at the exact nature of the atmosphere of a planet. And itself, it will not tell you very much. What is interesting is when you combine all these planets together, when you will compare them, Maybe you will see some of them, they are, there is kind of a group of planets. They will find group of, of atmosphere. Or, or you will find there is so many different atmospheres. There's a lot of diversity. And all this is going to happen. So we can study, we will be studying by the few techniques, I hope I convinced you, um, what this atmosphere would look like. The challenge here, the practicality is to do that, you need to bring people that are not usually working together, which means the biologist, the molecular biologist, the geophysicist, the astrophysicist. And when I say the astrophysicist is the one that are building telescope or space missions, also the one that are doing the atmosphere analysis. And, and that's a very, very complicated problem because actually it's difficult to just understand each other, to have this common language. This is a, the reason why I'm advocating, I mean, very strongly for the need of a more global approach here that is breaking the boundary of science you Usually, where they have these kind of silos and only the astrophysicists talking to astrophysicists and so on. And they're trying to expand a little bit. And my hope is to create a new generation of, of scientists that are becoming enthusiasts by, by the idea of to make progress here and to try to work on a more global scale, focusing on the work still, but trying to understand globally. It's a very long process here. I mean, this is a very long um, vision that, that we are trying to, uh, uh, trying to adopt. But I do believe that any, any planet that we're going to find will make a little bit of a step here. And everybody's convinced that there is resilience of planets around. So it's not a problem of the planet. No, it's a problem is to, 
trying to get something out of them. And as you know, there is big telescope being built, there is fantastic space mission being designed right now, there is maybe the future generation as well. So I have great hope that uh, this field that started with a very, very awkward planet called 51 Peg B is going to resonate you now for a kind of a new theme of the science, really, that is related to uh, life in the universe, actually. Thank you very much. I have some time for questions now. Thank you very much, Didier. That was that was a great talk. Uh, it's very exciting to see how we're on the brink of of a new field that's opening up so beautifully. Mm. Um, to start, I, I was wondering you you showed some some of those images of the of the different size of the of the atmosphere depending on what wavelength we're looking at, and I've seen many predictions and works on on transits and and transmission light curves, and especially the transmission spectra of, of planets to examine their their uh, their atmospheres. But is there any prediction for maybe James Webb or the future generation of telescopes to do it uh, in a time-resolved manner so that we can look at the at different layers of the atmosphere? Is there any work going into that? Yeah, well, uh, we, would we would dream about that. Well, I mean, we, we have to remind ourselves that a space mission like Webb takes 30 years to, 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 to be maybe even more. No, Webb has not been designed at all by the people within mind planet, planetology. They were designed by people looking for the deep, deep side of the universe, the origin of the universe, and all the optimization of that telescope was done that way. Well, when, when the planet, I mean, came up as a big burst, they realized that they should try to adjust. And they did something quite, quite remarkable, because usually in a space mission, you cannot really twiggle and change stuff. They have changed some parameter of some of the instruments or web to do something that was not thought, which is observing bright stars. I mean, web was not planned at all to observe bright stars. So they had a really, a, I mean, hard, I mean, a hard task to make it work for bright stars. So the web is, let's say, the, the, it's not an instrument which is being done for that, and and but we will be doing great stuff because it's a six meter telescope in the, in the infrared in space. So there's clearly hope that we will do some atmospheric measurements. And uh, the idea of to pick up water, for example, which is very easy to pick. Water is everywhere in the universe, so we will expect to find water on some of this planet. It's very very dramatically visible. Um, so so we should be able to do that. Uh, whether we will see other molecules, like CO2 is already quite easy to do. I think it's likely on some of this planet, more likely the Neptunes, and there's a lot to learn about this Neptune, the diversity of the Neptune. I remind you, these Neptunes are not the one we have, and they are really close, and they're hot, they're hot Neptunes. So, so there's a very interesting astrophysics to understand how far they, they, they compare. And uh, we may need a new generation of, of equipment here that will be designed with the specifics of the exoplanetology. And you know, there's a couple of names and, and in Luvo, Life, and I mean, there's plenty of them. And, and I think the, the community is bubbling with that right now. But since it takes between 30 to 50 years to, to make it, I think the idea was try to, to get, I mean, to build up. And, and we will have a mission sooner or later which similarly to Webb, which is designed to do galaxy uh, studies, um, will be doing exactly what you said. In that case, we need to get rid of the transit because the transit is very, very limited. I mean, there's nothing worse. I mean, the transit is the worst possible techniques you can imagine to do that kind of job. Uh, first, I mean, you can only pick up the small planet. They're very awkward. And then most of the time, they don't do anything. I mean, the transit is just, just, just a very short event. Even if you have a, a planet like the Earth, it's, it's going to take you eight hours, that's it. And, and the rest of the time, for, for the 364 days, you do nothing. So, so it's not really a good way to use this, this, kind of, this kind of technology. So if you can imagine you can really make an image and keep tracking, then you have days and days and days. You can keep measuring, adding the data, and then to try to look about maybe the season effects, anything like that. So we will be doing that tomorrow. But tomorrow means maybe in 50 years, but it's going to happen because you're not breaking any law of physics to do that. It's just a matter of the equipment you, you build up and the way you design your equipment, which up to now, no one has done that. The only equipment that has been properly designed was the one to do transit, to do statistics, essentially. And, and then we have used space, space, uh, space facilities 
to get something out of the atmosphere of the planet. And we have been amazingly successful because people are very clever and they, uh, they find tricks to use the equipment for different purposes, like it is uh, in, in science. That is why there is so many great results. And there will be great results with web. So we should not declare because web is just transit and essentially um, not, do to, uh, not designed for that. It's not going to, to make breakthrough. I mean, there will be a breakthrough with web because we have clearly short period planet on very low mass star by Trappist. And, and Trappist is there is a couple of objects, a couple of uh, two or three of this planet within the habitable zone. So there is a certain hope that you may have liquid water on these planets and you would see maybe a, a, an atmosphere or something there. So, so I think there will be surprises. And in the next 10 to 20 years, I think um, people will get a better idea maybe what we should be designing for the next generation of equipment. Thank you. Uh, we also have a question here by Arto Silva Magalhães. And of course, he's capitalizing on the on the recent announcement. Yeah, <laughs> asking about I saw it, yeah. and the X-ray transit. Why is it so difficult to observe exoplanets outside our galaxy? Well, because it's very far. <laughs> now, the the problem of the transit. I think it's just super cool. I mean, this discovery. I, I love it. I think everybody believes that planet under the galaxies. That's pretty clear. Um, what is challenging is um, you you have to disentangle. I think uh, anything from the background. And when you do have a transit, you know, when you have a, an event of the transit, it does not mean it is a planet transiting it. You have to demonstrate it's not something in the background. So when you observe stars around the galaxy, it's already complicated enough to identify this. When you can imagine, when you observe just something in another galaxy, in that case, in the background, you have thousands of thousands of stars. So the challenge is that is when you see a signal, does it come from the star you believe it's a planet or it's just, just something at the back that looks like and that could be anything else. It could be a binary. So that's really what is very difficult here. X-ray makes it even more difficult. So I don't know whether it's a, it's, it's a planet, but I think it's a very cool result. So we, we have to see. Uh, and it would be nice to, to do the counterpart and to have really a visible counterpart. I don't know whether it's visible, uh, this. And that would bring more some evidence, but I think it's great. And everybody's expecting that you know, look, every star should have a planet, essentially. The star without a planet are rare. Because when you form when you form a star, you have a little bit of leftover. And you need so little to form, a, to form a planet. So it comes for free. So you have always something. Even some pulsar managed to make a planet. So you can imagine if even at that stage, after the supernova explosions, they managed to do something. So it seems that building up uh, something orbiting uh, as soon as you're completely dominated by the by the gravitation and the angular momentum, so that's what it is. You're forming planets. So they, there is planet everywhere. The only question is what they look like, and uh, and what exactly is the is the structure and the nature of this planet. But I think the idea that that there is planet on every star, I think, is right now um, well recognized by everybody. Uh, we also have a question by Gabriel Fonseca. He's asking us. Uh, he's asking you, could you tell us a bit more about possible inorganic sources of molecular high oxygen exoplanetary atmospheres? Well, that's what I've been trying to, uh, to, to mention by, by, by quoting Vicky Meadows. I, I think depending on the nature of the surface of the planet, the, the problem if you're obsessed by the Earth, you imagine the Earth, but you can imagine other kind of planet, planet without any water at all, and you get desiccated, and you can have planet with, with water, but then we have reaction with another atmosphere. So the chemistry always drive uh, something. So if you have water, I think uh, if you break the water, you have a strong ultraviolet flux and, and, there, is, and there is only a vapor water and you, you, you're you breaking the molecules and you, you, you're making something anyway. So, so there is always a way to produce um, um, molecules. You have to really build up the complete network of the chemistry and that depends on the assumption you're making on the planet, and that's the big, the big open, uh, the big open point. So I think you can essentially claim anything. So the problem of the people claiming for oxygen and and, and, and life, they're absolutely obsessed to 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 believe to what they're doing instead of being open-minded and trying to see what are the various possibility, what is exactly really the possibility. And my my point here is, I think. I don't really care if there are oxygen or not. What I do care is to understand the, the more global geophysical nature of the planet. Now, of course, there will be oxygen if there is water, but is it the oxygen relevant for life? You need quite a substantial amount of, uh, of living organisms to create that. And there is certainly a possibility to create oxygen without um, being having anything uh, organically produced here uh, on, on the planet. 
there's a couple of paper by, by Vicky, you can have a look at that. This is really hardcore chemistry, it's, right? it's pretty cool. If you don't understand chemistry, <laughs> it's good to open a textbook to understand that stuff. And then it becomes much more clear. If you play Lego when you were young, that's exactly the same. So you just you break <laughs> apart. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, so another question, this is a more general question, perhaps by Bruno Rodriguez. He's asking, based on thousands, thousands of exoplanets discovered so far, how does the knowledge of planet formation change to incorporate these new understandings and give them a more robust theory? Well, there has been a kind of a drop. figure out that the motion of the planet is something that comes almost every time and uh, and and then you have to figure out how you keep building the planet when you include this dynamical element with the disk the disk we have the picture of the disk was very simple and and now with a powerful um, simulation of the computers you can really work to many details we have this beautiful series of this picture from alma that nobody really understand entirely i mean there is really very strange shape and, and I think we're talking about a very complex object here, uh, with a very dynamical and, and non-linear, uh, uh, I think, uh, I think process. So, so I think we're trying to expand a little bit from a very simplistic theory that is essentially only obsessed by the by the solar system into something a bit more generic. And and if you want to make a comparison, I think um, we are getting closer closer to the people. I mean, pr predicting the weather. So I think the complexity is such that you can turn a, lot, turn a couple of knobs here and there, change a bit the parameter, and you can end up with essentially every, everything you like. So this is what is demonstrated. You get a bit everything you like uh, in the planetology. And there is some region where you don't have planet, but this is understood. It's most often it's a time scale issue or because it's unstable. Um, but I think the, the complete picture of the planet formations has completely changed right now. And, and there is some element that people are still working hard on it. And like I was mentioning the hot Jupiter, frankly, we still don't understand practically how you can make them. It's not very clear. I mean, why are they so inflated? I mean, how do you stop the migration? So there's a couple of ideas here, but we're not really sure exactly whether it's which one is the most valid. Maybe there is a series of events that is needed. And uh, I think the theory that was one became manifold. So right now there is different theories uh, at the same time, and maybe they're all correct, and you branch one at some point or you branch another one depending on the configuration in the disk. That's that's exciting. There's there's still a lot to be learned there. Uh, we have a question by Pedro Henrique Nogueira. He's he used to be a student at Valongo. He's now in Chile doing his PhD. Yes. He's asking, in your opinion, which are the necessary observable parameters to claim for life discovery on an exoplanet in the future? Well, I think if somebody claim uh, for that, I mean, this person is a liar because we cannot do that <laughs> at that point. It's impossible. As I said, the only thing you can say is, well, from what we believe being the atmosphere of the planet, I mean, there is something that we don't really understand by, by life. So the only things that we can imagine is it must be something like a life. But, but actually, the complexity of, of the atmosphere is relevant. The, what happened with Venus is fascinating because, because people did a very complete study. They detected this phosphine, or they believed they detected the phosphine in the data. And they did a complete study. And they, they could do that because they had a much deeper understanding of the, of the atmosphere of Venus. It's next door. So, so And then they concluded by doing all... It's, it's a fascinating, I mean... Paper, it's, it's huge, and they run all the chemistry, anything, and they, they demonstrate by running all this that, well, the only way to, to explain the phosphine is due to life. Well, the problem is the data. Uh, actually, they misinterpret the, the data itself. So, so they get tricked by the size of the Venus and the interferometric measurements. But, but my point here, if you can do the very same for a planet, I think I may start to believe something here. But, but look back at the paper, they're talking about the zillions of molecules being measured. So I think until the time we have not only a couple of, of molecules, but really a very detailed understanding of the planet, it will be tremendously difficult. And even that, I think nobody would believe that because until you bring back some rocks or something to demonstrate there are some life. So there will be some element. And, and what is even more interesting, so you can imagine we may see quite a lot of planets where we have an evidence of uh, there is no life because it has been a massive thermonuclear war. And that could maybe tell us about life 
and and what 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 is the future of our own life as well when you think that there is ex exactly the possibility is going to happen one day uh, on earth so you know the idea of what you learn for life is very complicated and and we have to really to to have this perspective but my point is if you don't understand the geophysics first you're just a liar if you if you pretend that you find life uh, and because because it's just it's just not something we could be doing yeah that, that's interesting um i know you're running out of time and yeah i just want the last question so that's okay one, yeah. one last question thank you i'm sorry everyone i know there are more questions uh, and i'll yeah, just yeah i know that <laughs> Uh, I'm sorry it's about that. It's a fun that. topic. I can talk for hours. I mean, <laughs> <laughs> we'll, we'll need you to come back and give another talk in our institute. Yeah, exactly. Then we have <laughs> to continue the discussion with uh, with a cocktail <laughs> at the beach or something. That, that would be great. We'll, we'll have to schedule that. Uh, we have finally. I think that that's a good wrap up question here. This is Yana Machins. She's a PhD student at our institute. And she wants to change the subject a little bit and Oops. something that uh, she really cares about. Uh, she wants to talk a little bit about climate change and what astronomers can, can do. I think we have to bring, uh, to, bring to light the, the, the climate breakdown and its consequences, but how can we engage our community into to discuss such an important topic? Yeah, it's it definitely a very important topic. So I um, thank you for, for the question. So my, my point on that but has always been the same. Um, I keep saying, I mean, scientifically, the problem is solved. I think we have said since 30 years, what is going to happen? I think the, the 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 no everybody seems to realize this, but if you look back in the 80s, I mean there's a couple of paper that is predicting exactly what is happening right now. So I think it's pretty clear what is going to happen. It's pretty clear that this is what's happening. So in terms of science understanding, this is a solved problem. The problem is not about science here. The problem is how the society is responding to that. And then it's more about the society structure. It's more about um, how come that some part of the society doesn't really care about understanding what's going on. They, they are blind and they're happy of being absolutely blind. Um, and I think the COVID was interesting because it demonstrated a little bit that in Brazil, you're experiencing maybe a kind of extreme case because you have a government that essentially believes that there is no COVID. I'm pushing a little bit, but that's a bit what, they, what they're doing. Oh, we should not worry about that. So I think this is exactly the problem. So my point on that is, it's a problem that has to be dealt uh, by an army of psychologists and sociologists and economists, because at the end, that's a problem of society and how the society respond to a threat. So that's not, this is not science. Well, it is science, it's knowledge, but that's respond is as a society, a sociological response to threat and to something which is more global that have to project to the future. And the other element is, I think it's going to cost a lot of money. I think the people that have been that are running business, they believe they don't want to do that because it's going to put eager money. I think they don't realize that it's going to cost billions and billions and trillions and trillions because changing the temperature is going to expand the ocean. So there's nothing you can do. This is just very simple physics. I mean, this you, you learned that at grad school. Well, if you expand the, the ocean, you rise the, the oceans. When you know there is about one or two billion people living close to one or two meters, uh, of uh, of the oceans, you can imagine that all the big city will be underwater, and uh, and uh, and that will be a massive uh, disruption for the society. So I'm, I'm really worried not about the science here because it's well understood, it's because of the lack of communication we have in the science. And I keep arguing that we sh it's time for the scientists to take the power and to become president. So I would engage you if you want to do something to become president of Brazil, a physicist <laughs> president of Brazil. Would be would be a great president for the cause of the climate climate uh, global climate and, warming. And definitely <laughs> a huge step up, I would say, from what we have right now. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, did you? I would just would like to thank you yeah. very much for the yeah. for the discussion afterwards. I think it was it was very rich, and we do have some more questions here. Unfortunately, we won't be able to no, answer. I will so have to go we'll yeah. have to invite you over again. Yes, sometime. I will come. I promise. I will come in Brazil. I will stay a couple of days. I, I, I keep. A, I have a lot of invitation in Brazil. I, I, have a, I have a lot of friends that are moving there. So that's okay. Yeah, that I will would, come. Be, I promise. So <laughs> hope, hopefully we'll be able to make that happen sometime soon. Yeah, yeah, so yeah. thank you very much again for, for your talk. And thank you everyone for being here. Uh, thank you to the public. And we'll come back in two weeks with another seminar. So thank you very much. And bye-bye, everyone.